Integrity is important to me, and that means living my morals. I found these words by Kathleen Dean Moore, editor of the book Moral Ground, Ethical Action for a per Planet in Peril, eloquently express my lifestyle. When confronted with realities of climate change, many people do not know what to do or how to feel. Blindly hopeful and totally hopeless are the extremes. But it is a false choice to be hopeless, and it is also false to have blind hope. They are both morally irresponsible. Blind hope says, I don't have to do anything because it's all going to be all right. Utter despair says, Earth is going to be ruined no matter what I do, so I don't have to do anything. That leaves us with nothing to do on either side. It's not my problem. But I live in the middle. There's moral integrity, there's wholeness. That's how we live our lives, is in the middle of those two extremes. That's where we live where we are. We act in such a way as to honor our views that life is a sacred gift. We live simply because we don't need more than our fair share. We act lovingly toward the earth because we love it. We care for our neighbors because we are able. There are motivations for acting that are beautiful and powerful and don't focus on the consequences of our actions. They have everything to do with our moral motivations and the consistency with what we believe is right and true. This means a fierce, tireless, and maybe tragic defense of the world against those who would wreck it. How do I act out my morals against the institutions that are destroying the systems that sustain the earth? Conscientious objection is a joyous and liberating response. Conscientious objection for this is divestment. It is the bicycle. It is local food and the well-insulated home. It is recycled paper, birth control, and thoughtful family planning. It is the garden, the potluck, the poison-free yard. It is thoughtful parenting and teaching my children what they need and their responsibilities. These are all the things I believe in. This is my moral integrity, and this is what I will do. I object to consumerism because of my morals. I will not be a participating foot soldier in the war against the world. Woo! Woo! Thank you, Melissa. Our next speaker is Peter Deves from the local uh, Sierra Club chapter. Thank you. Great to see you all here. And thank you for that great list of personal actions we can all take to help change the course here. The Sierra Club was begun over 100 years ago out of concern to protect the magnificent beauty of our country from exploitation and private ownership so that all might enjoy them. Now it is clear that the defining issue of our time, an extreme test for human civilization, is climate change. If we do not take definitive action to slow its pace and reverse its path, scientists warn of crises that can destabilize our planet, destroy our civilization, and cause widespread extinction of species. From far and wide around Earth, people are affirming that we have the resources and will to make the changes needed to protect our planet for our children and future generations. With this march, we join a grassroots movement to make the changes needed happen. Thank you for joining us and taking the spirit of a song from some years ago, I say, shape it up, step forward, move ahead. It's not too late, do it, do it now. Pope Francis calls on us as people of faith to live our vocation to be protectors of God's handiwork. The Unitarian Universalist tradition has tended to put it this way, that we must live with respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. We're coming to realize, though, that respect isn't quite enough. Respect 
feels a little distant and how easy it is to respect something from afar. And our earth deserves more than that. More than that is asked of us. None of us, not one person, can remain distant from this issue any longer. As poet Mary Oliver writes, there are a thousand unbreakable links between each one of us and everything else. The care of the earth is profoundly linked to the care of humanity. If environmental injustice separates us from nature and from the fragile ecosystems that allow us to live, it also separates us one human being from another, worsening the strain on already vulnerable communities, dividing those of us now alive from those who will follow us to whom we're accountable, and dividing us from ourselves turning away from the urgency of climate justice makes us destroyers and we were meant to be protectors. We were meant to live with reverence for life, for the interdependent web of all that is. Mary Oliver calls it remembering our place in the family of things. So rather than opting for mere respect, let us hope to live with reverence for the earth seeking environmental justice and renewal. Let us hope to remember who we really are and who we were meant to be. Not a destructive presence, but a healing presence. May love be our guide. Love for this planet, love for our human family, and love for life itself. May love transform our hearts so that we may transform our ways of living on this good earth. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, so good to be here today. And uh, I want to share a rhyme, a nursery rhyme. When all of us know this rhyme when we were growing up, this is a rhyme, in fact, that I actually don't like. It goes like this. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. And Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men could not put Humpty back together again. Now, I share that rhyme because uh, this nursery rhyme attempts to teach our children that brokenness is a reality of life with no chance of being able to be fixed again. And what's so sad about the ending of that rhyme, in my opinion, it teaches us that when you are broken or the things around you break, that we have no power to put back something that needs to be put back again. And I'm reminded in Paul's letter, in Romans chapter 8, verse 20, where it shares in contemporary language, meanwhile, creation is confused. And the air we breathe and the pollution in the water, the lead paint that our children swallow, the fossil fuel dependent economy, the level of toxic vehicles and factory emissions, and all of the garbage in the industrial wastes that go into our ocean, our waterways, are elements of confusion because our hands have created them. So we are called as spirit-led people, not just environmentalists, but all of us are called as a way to help fix what hands might have brought confusion, what hands might have brought brokenness. As God's people, as spirit-led people, no matter what faith, no matter what tradition we are a part of, are called to go into the systems and go into situations that we are witnessing, such as our ecology system, such as our environment and climate changes. And we have the ability to change what God has destined us to be. Scripture also reminds me that says that I can do all things through him that gives me strength. And I wake up every day with that understanding that though hands might have brought destruction among our climate, and hands might have brought destruction among our systems that we were meant to protect, we were meant to uphold our waterways, we were meant to uphold our community, particularly impoverished communities that have been weakened, we were called to uphold that and protect that. God has given us the strength that we have the ability with our hands to go in and put back together again. For I am a believer.
that we can do anything when good people, spirit-led people, not just environmentalists, spirit-led people can work with environmentalists and work with other people to bring back, to bring back things that have been broken. That's justice to me. That's justice when injustice occur that we can come back together again and bring about a future for our children. Our children. I'm a witness to, to know that when environment have struck our communities, environmental issues have struck our land, God has given us the ability that we can go into those neighborhoods, go into the oceans, go into our communities, particularly in, in, in impoverished communities where, 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 for instance, like vehicles and, and gas emission are let in the environment. We have the ability that we can change all of that. So I'm thankful to be here with each and every one of you because I believe that our hands, the same hand that brought destructions are the same hands that can go in and restore. The same hand that brought brokenness is the same hands that can restore. For we can do all things through him that gives us strength. And if we can do that, we can do that. We can restore Rochester. We can restore this country. We can restore anything. Don't let anybody tell you anything different because we can do all things through him that gives us strength. God bless. Thank you so much, Reverend Marlow. Our next speaker is Sandy Frankel, candidate for County Executive. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And let's say amen to Reverend Marlow Washington. Amen. You know, I grew up in Miami Beach, Florida. We experienced hurricanes, often one or more every year. I know what that's like. When I came to Rochester, um, we didn't have hurricanes. We didn't have tornadoes. We didn't have earthquakes. We didn't have enormous floods or extreme drought. But as we look at the impacts of climate change on this nation, on this planet, one Earth, one planet, there is no question that we are facing a, a serious planetary um, catastrophe if we don't act now. We still have time, but time is running out. And the Pope has sent an incredible message to our nation, to the world, about the fact that we are one family, one human family. We've got to come together. We've got to make change. We can do it. As Margaret Mead said, it only takes a small group of dedicated people to change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Right here, we have to think locally while we consider the global impacts of climate change. So as we did in the town of Brighton during my time as supervisor, as we need to do now here in Monroe County and throughout the larger community, we need to take steps in our homes, in our businesses, in our institutions to put in place procedures, policies, and actions that will reduce our carbon footprint, plant more trees, uh, reduce um, the, the gas emissions from our cars, use greater energy efficient lighting. There are just so many things that we can do to help our planet heal. And that's what we have to do. So as we embark on our walk down to the county office building together, we can send a message to this community that the county government also has to step up as other communities, other governments have here in Monroe County and around the country to, to take those positive steps, those actions that will help to reduce the potential for climate change and ensure that our children, our grandchildren have a planet that is sustainable, a life and quality of life that it needs protection and that is good for their future and beyond. So congratulations to all of you for being here. This is a great start today. Um, I'm just so inspired by the Pope and by the message he carries. Um, here in God's green earth, God bless you all. I am feeling a special sense of privilege to be with you all today as we are marking a, a singular and stunning example of moral courage and leadership 
globally. The actions by Pope Francis in elaborating on this climate crisis, which has the potential to change human civilization as we know it. Human civilization as we know it is a profound and stunning act of faith, of intellectual courage, of political acumen and risk. I stand with you as a labor activist of many, many years, as the vice president of Metro Justice, with a sense of how critical it is that we use every skill that we have to address this challenge. The Pope, sorry, the Pope minced no words in saying that the economic system, which has its hands around global energy production and distribution, must be changed. Not all of us are in a position to really say with open hearts and clear minds that capitalism is a systemic and endemic cancer upon the, the planet, but some people are in that position. And some people are bearing witness to the inequities that occur globally. The millions of people who live lives impoverished without clean water, without energy at all, while the privileged residents of the first world debate carbon utilization and other programs which have the potential to do some remedying, but to not fundamentally and systemically bring equity to, as Reverend Marlowe said, all of God's children, all of the human beings and life beings in the planet. There's an international group, I'm, as you can see, really off my notes because they keep flying away as I was standing over there, called Trade Unions for Energy Democracy, which is a global confederation of unions from multi-sectors who are looking to advance the democratic control and direction of energy and energy utilization. We seek to find solutions and promote solutions to the climate crisis, to energy poverty, and the degradation of both land and people, indigenous peoples, and to respond to the attacks on workers' rights and protections. Sister Naomi Klein, says that the climate crisis in her brilliant new book, which should be your bedside reading, this changes everything, profoundly analyzes the crisis that we face. There are solutions. It's a moment of great risk and great opportunity which makes this celebration of this moment of leadership by Pope Francis and all of you who are members of the community of faith so singular. Let's take our joint commitment and move forward with speed and with grace. Thank you. The last speaker is me. My name is Mary Lupian. I'm a mother and stepmother to two wonderful little girls who really like to run around in circles. 
and a volunteer organizer with Mothers Out Front, an organization dedicated to organizing mothers around the issue of climate change on behalf of our children, our ch all children and future generations. After the birth of my daughter, suddenly everything became more important. I used to be much more daring as a younger person. I used to hike active volcanoes and roast marshmallows over the lava, take chances with street food and walked home alone late at night in Guatemala. But after becoming a mother, I started to take fewer risks because I realized my life was now in service of caring for and protecting my daughter. Protecting our children is one of the biggest responsibilities there is. And I fear that I will not be able to fulfill my responsibility in the face of the climate crisis. With every extreme weather event this world experiences, whether it's an overnight drop in temperature to 80, from 80 to 50 degrees, which we saw earlier this summer in Rochester, or thousands dying in India due to heat waves, or the Washington rainforest catching on fire for the first time in history, I am filled with anxiety thinking about the future my children will grow up in. What will they have to face? What will their world look like? Certainly not the one that I grew up in. Several times this summer I could not sleep because I was paralyzed by this fear. My fear transformed into an irrational fear that I had to protect my kids from an intruder in our house or from dying in the night checking on them several times to make sure they were okay or still breathing. I fear not only for the world we'll leave our future generations after we're gone, but I also fear for right now. People are suffering and dying right now because of climate change. The only thing that calmed me enough to be able to sleep was planning this rally. I was fortunate enough to be part of a small group of people that came together to put this event on. I have found that action is the only remedy for my fears and anxieties. Worrying about climate change won't make it go away. Ignoring climate change won't make it go away. I challenge all of you to transform any fear or anxiety you might be feeling into action. Into righteous anger at a system that disregards human suffering in the pursuit of profit. And into hope for humanity. We are the first generation to feel the impact of climate change, and we are the last generation who can do anything about it. We have a moral obligation to act. We must meet this climate challenge with the appropriate level of outrage and innovation. We must embrace new, cleaner energy technologies, as well as reduce our personal consumption. Individual change is so important. We must learn to live more sustainably in relationship with our Mother Earth. But it is too late for individual change alone to be effective. Government policy change and the swift and complete transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources at a high level is the only way we can respond quickly enough to make a difference. Elected officials, hear this. If climate justice is not at the top of your platform, you will not get my vote. And I hope everyone in the cloud will commit to doing the same.